our identity has to come from the defensive end. You've got that? We've got to guard. We've got to have energy. Our hands have got to be active. We've got to get deflections. We've got to be flying, moving, multiple effort plays, second, third, fourth efforts in one possession. Everyone understand that? Okay? We have a great crowd. The students are here. Enjoy the game. Let's go get a win. Here we go. Let's play for each other. Team on three. Team on three. One, two, three. Team. That was cute. That was cute. Josh Pastner's team is healed, healthy, and whole. And tonight, Georgia Tech welcomes Notre Dame to McCamish Pavilion, all part of the ACC on ESPN. With Dino Gaudio, I'm Anish Schropp. It's the second meeting in less than two weeks between these two teams. But this time, it's Notre Dame that's going to be shorthanded big time. And these major losses for Notre Dame without Colson and Farrell. Her average could combine 37 points a game. Colson is the ACC's second leading scorer, third leading rebounder. For the Irish, others have had to step up, and they have. Rex Pfluger's averaging nearly 14 points a game. With two seconds to go, had the game-winning tip in against Syracuse. And TJ Gibbs last week was the ACC Player of the Week, where he averaged nearly, well, he averaged 20 points a game and nearly six rebounds and two wins against NC State and Syracuse. Notre Dame, despite the injuries, 3-0 in the ACC. It's the Irish's third game without Colson, the preseason Player of the Year in the conference. Matt Farrell out for his second game, could be back in the game against Louisville set for next Tuesday. That according to head coach Mike Bray. Look at the starting five for Notre Dame. Right now, TJ Gibbs, the only healthy player on the roster, averaging double figures. Elijah Burns making his first career start. And DJ Harvey feeding Burns in the low post and comes away to Ben Lammers. For Georgia Tech, Josh Okogi averaging 20 a game. Missed the first eight games of the season with a suspension and a finger injury. Ben Lammers, a force in the middle. He's got the ball, number 44. The offense runs through him, as does the defensive scheme. Anish, when Lammers is healthy, he's practicing, he's at shoot-arounds, and obviously, he's a better player, and because they play for him so, so much, that's vital for Georgia Tech offensively. Georgia Tech is not going to feel bad about what Notre Dame is going through because they've been through it. A 6-7 and seven start for the Yellow Jackets as Harvey misfires. He was 1-14 for 14 over the weekend. But, Dino, this Georgia Tech team, the first part of the season, everybody was injured. Kogi was suspended. Tyler Jones was suspended. Jackson was suspended. Josh Pastner finally has most of his guys back. And even the guys who were playing, they were battling through injuries. And it's like Josh Pastner told us today, he, he's coached like seven different teams with all the injuries and suspensions. He goes, this is a much different team, Georgia Tech, after Christmas than they were before Christmas. Because right now, he's got guys back, healthy, and whole. And this guy right here, one of the better players, ACC all-freshman team last year, Okogi, one of the better players in the ACC. He had 30 in the win against Miami last week, which is when Georgia Tech served to notice that this is a different team post-Christmas. Rex Fluger can't finish, and scoring a little more of a chore now for Notre Dame without Colson and without Matt Farrell. Fluger turns it over. Brandon Alston to a Kogi and Abdullahi Gay coming off a career high 14 against Yale. Georgia Tech's a team that labors to score at times. The more baskets they can get in transition off turnovers like they just did, that bodes well for the Yellow Jackets. And then he's seeing Georgia Tech in their 1 1 3 zone, which was really effective against Notre Dame in the first half of game one. TJ Gibbs. He's played well in the absence of Colson and Farrell. And this is something Notre Dame's been doing the last few games. They have been crashing the offensive glass. Well, Mike Gray said, hey, we got bigger lineup right now. We have to emphasize that, and they have. 16-0 second chance points for Notre Dame against Georgia Tech in their game one win 11 days ago. They were just Irish. tenacious on the offensive glass. And against Syracuse, 21 offensive rebounds, plus 15 off to a cold start, shooting it here as Jose Alvarado can't connect. Tried to take it away from Harvey. Irish 0 for 5 from the field. 
And Anise, what we see out of Georgia Tech on misses, they go back to man to man. When they score, they're in their zone. First field goal of the game for Notre Dame from Martinez Gevin, the senior out of Lithuania. Brandon Alston, grad transfer from Lehigh. And the rebound pulled down by Gevin, who had a career high 14 in the win against Syracuse. Gibbs all the way to the basket. And a timeout by Josh Pastner. Well, one of the things Josh isn't happy about is their transition defense. They want to make sure they get back defensively. If they do, they have a great chance of taking down the Irish. When Josh Pastner was hired last year, his bosses told him, you won't win a single ACC game. He won eight, got to the NIT championship. It's been harder this year because of all the games missed by key players and then Ben Lammers their second best player has been hampered by a nagging ankle injury for the first month and a half and these big difference between excuses for losing guys making excuses and reasons Georgia Tech has had some reasons early as we saw with all of the injuries and we see a walk right there for Georgia Tech on game but like I said difference between excuses and reasons Georgia Tech has had numerous reasons as we saw here is Rex Fluger. And again, so as the viewers are watching the game on scores or dead ball situations, you'll see Georgia Tech go back to their 1-1-3 zone. Harvey now 0 for 2. Had a nice game against NC State last Wednesday, a career-high 17. Started that game in place of the injured Colson. Kogi off the screen from Gay. Now Todrick Jackson. Shot clock winding down. Lammers off the window too strong. Now they play through him on the perimeter, but he has to remember where his bread is butter. He needs to spend time inside on the blocks. Scoop shot by Fluger, not there. Irish. Just two of nine. Here comes a Kogi. Lays it in. He's got four. You know what, Anise? He, he's shooting 43% from threes, but you have to play him first as a driver. Boy, he is a forceful, strong, aggressive guy taking the ball to the basket. He was suspended the first six games and missed two more, dealing with a dislocated finger. He's got four of the six for Georgia Tech. Yellow Jackets with the early lead. And exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Axe. State Farm. Talk to an agent today at 800 State Farm. And Sam Adam. Fill your glass. Mike Bray, one day before Throwback Thursday. Those were from the Northwestern State days. Now, after the win last week against NC State, he is the winningest head coach in Notre Dame history, passing our former colleague Digger Phelps. And Digger is a legendary. And I tell you, the other thing that's shocking is in East. Mike is the fourth, fourth longest tenured head basketball coach against amongst Power Five teams with 18 years. Beheim 42, Coach K 38, Izzo 23. It's just. I, I can remember when Mike was an assistant for Coach K on the sidelines there at Duke and then of course Delaware and Notre Dame and like Mike was saying I was just trying to not get fired when I got this job. Think about the state of the program when Bray took over at the time he was the third coach in as many seasons and now a bastion of stability. It, he really has been because if you remember Matt Gardy took over for just a year and went right back to North Carolina his alma mater. But stability is right. And you know, he's done it predominantly with four-year guys. Harvey turns it over. Talking to Josh Pastner today, he said he looks at a program like Notre Dame, like Virginia, as one that Pastner wants to model Georgia Tech after. It, it, and that's a great model to follow with, with academic schools where you want to do it with juniors and seniors. Uh, Coach K has shifted gears and 
has done it with the one and dones now, but there's what we're talking about. Longest tenured coaches in major conferences. And like I said, I look at that and shake my head a little bit. I remember when that guy was sitting on the bench with uh, Coach K. Foul is on Mooney, his first. Akogi. Lambert's fighting for the offensive rebound to tie it up. And the possession arrow to Georgia Tech. Well, that's what they need to do. They need to battle on the boards with this Notre Dame team that all of a sudden has become one of the better rebounding teams, not just in the ACC, but in the country. In the three conference games for the Irish, they are rebounding more than 41% of their misses. And you look at the margin, plus 15 against Syracuse, plus 11 against NC State, plus 11 in the first meeting against Georgia Tech. And Ish, I say this all the time, toughness manifests itself on the backboard and the defensive end of the floor. And that's what Notre Dame has morphed into, a rebounding team and a pretty good defensive team. Curtis Haywood with the three from the outside. The freshman returning to action Saturday against Yale. After missing six games with a shin injury. Irish on the attack, Austin Torres, the fifth year senior. Well, when Torres has it, Lambers has to know the kid's not a three point shooter, he's a driver. Now, Lambers has that ability. We know he could step out and shoot, but I, I just don't want him, and I don't think, more importantly, Pastor wants him falling in love with that face up 17 footer. Torres finds a wide open Mooney. Boy, that's great zone offense right there. Get the ball to the high post. When Lammers lifts up to play the ball, the bounce pass to the baseline. Akogi being guarded by Fluger. He's Notre Dame's top defender. Outside Rick Jackson. Going to his strong hand. Quick outlet. Fluger. Blocked by Akogi. It'll stay with Notre Dame. Alvarado knocked it out of bounds. Well, what a Kogi brings is athleticism. Terrific timing. Didn't give up on the play. That's a wonderful block. That's wonderful athleticism. Gibbs gets it back. Shoots over Lammers. Way off. And right there to clean up is John Mooney. The sophomore who does most of his damage usually from the perimeter. And, and you know what I love about the play, Anish? We would tell guys, if you can't get the offensive rebound, just get a hand on it. That's what Rex Fluger did. He tipped the ball to his teammate and obviously was rewarded with the basket. But pretty good job by Fluger of keeping the ball alive. Lammers can't finish. A few weeks ago, he would not have been even able to even do that. Exactly. Hampered by an ankle injury. It, it, exactly, and it's a guy that, that, like Josh Pastor was telling us, rarely even practiced. We're just playing in the games. Nico and Joe go. Five to shoot. Fluger falling away. And the rebound to Jackson. Tech had numbers. Akogi the up and under. And then he's, I, I love the decision by Jackson. The finisher was a Kogi on his left. He made sure he got him the basketball. Know who your score is when you have that three on two break. And we get a foul away from the ball. The best way to get easy baskets is on second shots and in transition. This is the Yellow Jackets in transition. Wonderful finish by Joshua Kogi. On Saturday, Notre Dame scored its first win in the Carrier Dome in more than a decade. Rex Fluger, the game-winning putback in the final seconds, and the Irish won despite scoring just 51 points, its fewest points in four years. No Bonzi Colson, he's out eight weeks with a fractured foot. No Matt Farrell, who's got a sprained ankle. But these two, Gibbs and Fluger, have stepped up 
not just with their production, but with their leadership. No question, Anish. And you saw in that play right there, Fluger, he ran past two Syracuse guys, just out-hustled them to get to the backboard. And that might be Notre Dame's future right now, playing not ugly games, but playing games you got to mess up in the mud a little bit, muck it up, and find a way to do it. And they did at the end of the game uh, in, at the carrier dome. Mike Bray told us that yesterday. He said, this is a team now that's identity is about defense and rebounding. And he's the biggest part of coaching is dealing psychologically with 18 to 23 year olds and convincing them this is what we need to do now. And you know what? He, he's done a masterful job of that. How many guys lose their top two scores, averaging nearly 37 points a game? And he's convinced these guys, hey, listen, we have all the pieces where we could still win. That's why they're 3-0 in the ACC. T.J. Gibbs checked by Alvarado, lost it. Jackson flips it ahead, but there to retrieve it is Elijah Burns. I think one of the things Mike Bray's teams always do, they play with confidence. He coaches confidence as well as anybody in America. And when guys come off the bench like they've had here, and when guys have to play bigger roles, they have. Kogi had it knocked away back to Jackson and he turns it over You can't turn it over and win games in the ACC Especially at home now. I love how Georgia Tech's driving the ball. You know why Notre Dame's not a team with a lot of depth now because of the injuries So let's attack them and try to put foul pressure on the Irish Gibbs down low and Gibbon lays it in for two and the Irish have their first lead Alvarado, freshman point guard out of New York City. Akogi leaning in, draws the contact, and he'll shoot two. Our women's Thursday night showcase features two of the top teams in the nation. We'll see. Second rank Notre Dame, coached by Muffet McGraw, taking on 18 0 and number three Louisville. Game on ESPN at 7 p.m. Eastern. Foul is on DJ Harvey, his first. How about Gino Ariama the other night? He was like mocking his team. Like, oh, I'll tell the officials that the, the other team can't play defense. They didn't even have a warm up in the second half. Boy, he laid into him at halftime. Uh, they responded. A lot of chatter on talk radio in the last couple of days after Nick Saban just won his sixth title about the greatest coaches. I mean, Gino Ariama. In the sport of basketball, doesn't he have to be in that conversation? Oh, and he's absolutely. And, and when it's all said and done, women and men's basketball, Gino will be the winningest coach of all time. On the men's side and the ladies' side, you could mark that down. He'll pass them all up. Here's Harvey. 0 for 3 after a 1 for 14 game against Syracuse. Gibbon off the nice give. And the big fella from Lithuania throwing down. Well, well, on the pick and roll action, Gay has to come over to the help side and help on that roll. He was late arriving because Lammers was laterally hedging on the ball screen. Alston, grad transfer from Lehigh, turns it over. Here's Fluger. He'll pull up for three. I mean, Fluger misses the three, but Pastor's not happy with the turnover because when we talked to him today, that was a major emphasis for them coming into the game tonight. And Fluger, after that shot, called to the bench. Notre Dame in their 2 3 zone now. Oh, Lammers, that shot doesn't fall, but he's an effective weapon with his game against the 2 3, isn't he? Absolutely, and he's here's why because he could catch it at the high post and score it from there albeit he missed the shot But he's a wonderful passer and he could pass out of that high post as well. Jogo is way off Mike Bray Hoping for Jogo 
to click offensively. He thinks that Jogo's got some potential and can really help this team. Great size to be at the top of that zone for Notre Dame and Jogo. Haywood, count the basket and the foul. Well, you can intimidate with the shot block or you can intimidate with the charge. Gavin stepping in there. That's wonderful defense right there. Before we went to break, Curtis Haywood was called for an offensive foul, so no basket for Georgia Tech. Irish up by one, 737 left in the first half. And they, they've done a pretty good job in the half court offensively in nation. And right now what we're going to see on inside the play right here is watch the ball screen. A pitch, let's freeze it right there. So what happens is when Lammer shows right here, when Lammer shows right here, his teammate has to get in there and help on the roll. That's Gay's responsibility. We can run it. See how Gay 34 is late getting there. Five players defensively need to guard the ball screen. The three guys not involved in the ball screen, they should have a foot in the lane to help on the roll. Gabbin in the high post. Ten to shoot. Harvey from the corner, way off, and you have to admire the confidence to keep putting up shots, but the last couple of games it hasn't been there for him. Like I said, what, what Mike Bray does as a coach, he doesn't want you looking over your shoulder, and the Irish guys do not. They play relaxed. Here's Harvey, one for his last 18, and steps. Saturday on ESPN, it's a College Hoops doubleheader for you. Number 21, Kentucky, which just edged Texas A&M last night. We'll take on Vandy at four. And then it is Notre Dame playing host to number 20, UNC. How about Luke May last night? 32 points, 18 rebounds against Boston College. <laughs> Heels back in the win column. Hey, since he made that shot to, to send uh, North Carolina to the Final Four, man, his confidence has been at an all-time high, and it should be. Alvarado for three, back iron. And right now, it, it just seems Georgia Tech a little lackadaisical, not as quick to a lot of these 50-50 balls. And, and, and these, like we were talking about, I think Josh Pastner wants them driving the ball to put foul pressure on Notre Dame because they don't have a lot of depth right now. Burns wide open. Nah, that's not that's not Elijah Burns' strength right there. He's only one for two from threes coming into the season, but the reason he took is taking just two because he's not a great three-point shooter. Burns snatches the rebound off the Jackson miss. Yellow Jackets just one field goal in the last five minutes. When you play Georgia Tech, they're 327th in the country and Ken Palm in pace of play, and that's what we have right here, a slow pace of play. There's Jogo off the shot fake, drives it to the basket, and will shoot two. And Lammers picks up his first. So far, the big, big guys, Gavin and Mooney with a dozen, the rest of the team six, and outside of Gavin and Mooney, the rest of the Irish have missed 15 of 17. And he's, the good thing for the Irish are those points in the paint because when they won in South Bend, they outscored Georgia Tech 30 to 18 in the paint, and, and they're heading in that direction again in this one. Also, 16 zip on second to chance points. How about Jogo? His family left the former Yugoslavia, went to Ontario, Canada to escape the civil war that was fought in the 90s in Yugoslavia. And uh, look where their son is now, one of the great academic institutions in the world and uh, playing college basketball. That is Abdullahi Gay from Senegal. He's got a 7-3 wingspan and has really come along in his redshirt junior year coming off a career high 14. Good 
matchup there with the Kogi and Fluger. Gibbs spinning. Kicks it to the corner. Mooney in and out. And the rebound to Jackson. Long outlet to a Kogi. Through the contact and the putback by Abdullah Gay, who's been active early. Well, that's wonderful hustle out of Georgia Tech. Follow those plays. Don't assume the ball's going to go through the basket on those layups. Terrific follow by Gay. He rewards himself in the Yellow Jackets. Six points for Gay. Fluger, his pass knocked away by Lammers. Boy, fake high, throw low on that pass. Make sure that's a bounce pass because a bounce pass is a feeding pass which leads into the layup. Lammers feeding Jackson. And you mentioned Lammers' passing ability from the high post. And he's, that's just an outstanding pass from a point guard, let alone a 6'10", 234-pound uh, guy. Terrific pass from Ben Lammers. Timeout Notre Dame, a 6-0 run by Tech. to number two, West Virginia. You've got Marvin Bagley, who's had back-to-back 30-point -back games for Duke. Miami, one of the best defensive teams in the country. And uh, Dewan Hewell having a breakout sophomore year. I had Miami on Sunday at home against Florida State. Chris Likes, five foot seven. If you have not seen him, boy, is he a spark plug for that team, especially when the Canes play in Coral Gables. Boy, he's electric, isn't he? And the fans just fall in love with the guy. Out of bounds to Georgia Tech. See, Gavin has to catch that ball a little low, lower or nearer the basket. When you're not as athletic as other guys, you have to be more physical. And it would serve him well if he'd have a little physicality with his post up so that he's catching the ball deeper in the lane, a little closer from where he could score from. Alvarado knocks down the three. A point guard out of Brooklyn. Went to Christ the King, one of the top basketball schools in the city, and following a tradition of pretty good New York City point guards to come to Georgia Tech, Kenny Anderson and Stefan Marbury paved that path. And you know what, Anish, with him, he's not a one-and-done guy like those guys were. Kenny, I think, was two years there, but he, he's a winner. He's a winner. He's not afraid. You can go into Cameron Indoor with him. You can go into the Smith Center with Alvarado, win games. There's our guy, Kenny Anderson. Boy, he did some good things for Coach Kremens, didn't he? And then Stephon Marbury, everybody thought he was going to go to Syracuse. Bobby Kremens convinced Rob Marbury broke your heart too. to go to Georgia Tech. Great, great basketball book. If you've never read it, The Last Shot by Darcy Frey came out about 20, 25 years ago. And Marbury, a central character, Lincoln High School, New York City. And Frey has this incredible access to Marbury and some of his high school teammates. And Marbury at the time was only about 14. He was the young wow. prodigy. And, you know, you get a front row seat into these Big East coaches at the time coming in and making their pitch. And uh, there is some tragedy involved. But in terms of access, one of the best books on basketball you'll read. The I've last read a, shot. I've read a million of them. i got to pick that one up for sure. Akogi kicks to Alvarado. That three is not there. Gay kept it alive, but it's Gavin with the rebound. Gibbs all the way. Yeah, so far, Gibbs is one for four. Fluger's 0 for five. And Harvey's 0 for four. And these, when you're going towards a shot blocker, you're, you're going up against the ACC's defensive player of the year last year in Lammers. You got to play off two feet, play strong. What a wonderful find right there in the finish from Ben Lammers. A young man whose ankle injury was so bad, even though he was playing through it, he only recently returned to practice just a little bit after Christmas break. I'll tell you, as a coach, you got to keep asking yourself, what does our team need right now? There's defense for Georgia Tech. Akogi with the block on one end. Jackson the follow and gets the roll. Largest lead of the game for the Yellow Jackets. It's a 13-0 run. And he's 
finish. Mike Gray cannot be happy with that. Multiple efforts by Georgia Tech. That's why they finished the play. Second and third shot opportunities. Notre Dame, you got to hustle back or else this is danger zone right now before half for the Irish. Padre Jackson, what a terrific pass. On target, on time. And in one shot, second, third. You know what? That's the Yellow Jackets right there, just out hustling the Fighting Irish. When you lose a Bonzi Colson and a Matt Farrell, that is 37 plus points per game. And the eligibility for Austin Carr has expired, so you're not <laughs> going to make that up with one guy. Scoring is going to be a struggle for Notre Dame without those two. What are the mitigating factors? How can they compensate for that? Well, and they, sh they, they have to do it, I don't think, with one guy scoring a bucket. I think the offense has to create scoring opportunities for them. Like, Bonzi Colson could create for himself. Matt Farrell can create for himself. But the offense is going to have to create scoring opportunities for Notre Dame. And one of the things they need to do well, if they're 0 for 7 in this game, this is a good three-point shooting team tougher than the win and we, we got obviously a, a ton of time to play 22 plus minutes but the 0 for 7 Notre Dame from behind the three-point line just 5 for 21 Saturday and still found a way to beat Syracuse Jogo Fluger in the corner and he's now 0 for 6 another offensive rebound Mooney can't finish, but he's able to draw the foul. I, I know one thing. Mike Bray is happy with both of those shots. That's a great find of Flugers on the drift pass to the corner and then the bounce pass inside. Now, that's, that's really good offense right there. Foul is on Gay, his second, and John Mooney at the free throw line. Sophomore out of Orlando who had originally committed to play at Florida when he was a high school sophomore decommitted after Billy Donovan left to take the Thunder job and actually considered amongst many Georgia Tech before settling on Notre Dame. Now that's Notre Dame the first point since the 855 mark of the second half here. Now they were down 28 23 in game one at halftime Notre Dame was and you're seeing Georgia Tech a little flex action. Now the Irish can go if they want, two for one right here, Anish. Two shots to Georgia Tech's one before the half. Fluger, who touched it last, it was a kickball. It'll stay with the Irish. The 23 first half points that Notre Dame had in South Bend against Georgia Tech, the lowest half of point productivity all season for them, and they're sitting on 20 right now. Gibbs nearly turned it over. Here's Fluger. Out of bounds to Georgia Tech. It was a risky pass by Torres. You, you can't make your mind up ahead of time. It's like Torres said, hey, he's cutting from the top. I'm going to throw it. Read the defense. Ten second differential. Game clock, shot clock. Jackson to Gay to Lammers the extra pass but the block from the help side. Notre Dame fortunate defensively right there. Ben, ben Lammers has to finish that. Nobody knows more than uh, him that uh, he, he, he's got to dunk that basketball right there. Final seconds. Gibbs to the basket blocked by Gay. Jogo puts it up and unable to find the bottom of the net. That's been the story. Notre Dame just 8 for 31 from the field in the first 20 minutes. And for the second straight game, the Irish held to 20 points or less in the first half. Will step aside for halftime. Coming up after the break, Chris Cotter and company have you covered with what's going on in college basketball. run and the Yellow Jackets have a 10 point lead on Notre Dame second meeting of the season already between these two the Irish won back on December 30th in that game Notre Dame had a healthy Bonsi Colson and a healthy Matt Farrell neither are healthy neither are playing tonight 
And Rex Pfluger and TJ Gibbs, who had been the guy stepping up for the Irish, one for 12 in the first half. And Ace, these two are really struggling right now. And we're talking about Pfluger, who had the game winner against Syracuse. They are struggling from the field. They are struggling from behind the three-point line. And I tell you, it's just a fact that those two guys don't step up and start playing better. And more importantly, scoring the ball better in the second half. Boy, Notre Dame is really going to struggle to score the ball. And now, listen, you're without Bonzi Colts and Matt Farrell, two guys that are combined 37 points a game. But the other two, Fluger and, and, and TJ Gibbs, have really stepped up in the latter two games, but struggling in the first 20 tonight. They'll need to step up in the second half if Notre Dame is to come back and improve to 4-0 in ACC play. Josh Okoge in Georgia Tech looking to build on that big win from Miami a week ago. Okoge's got eight. The Yellow Jackets up by 10. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Sam Adams. Fill your glass. Notre Dame's perfect ACC record in jeopardy. The Irish 3-0 in conference, down by 10. We told you at the top of the broadcast, Bonzi Colson out for eight weeks with a fractured foot. This is the third game for Notre Dame without Colson. It's their second game without point guard and second leading scorer, Matt Farrell. And T.J. Gibbs, one for five, two points in the first half. Rex Fluger, 0 for seven, scoreless. Those two are now the top two weapons offensively. Neither have gotten going. Both need to play better in the second half and, of the Irish. And these for those two guys, how do, how do you handle adversity? They're the leaders of the team now. Leadership is also visual, how you carry yourself, how you project yourself. Let's see how those two start the second half for Notre Dame. I, I know Mike Bray has to be telling them, fellas, listen, if we're going to make a mistake, Let's make a mistake, mistake by being aggressive. There you go. And Gibbs being aggressive with his second field goal. He is the reigning ACC player of the week. And he had a great week against NC State and Syracuse. Averaged 20 points, nearly six rebounds and five assists. Just, just needs to start to assert himself a little more here in the second half like he did on that drive. Lammers at good position, but it's knocked away. Last couple of games, Notre Dame. Well, the last game for Notre Dame, just 19 in the first half. They picked it up in the second half. In a niche, 11 days ago when they were losing to Georgia Tech, they were down 28-23 at halftime and went on an 8-0 run to start the second half and completely changed the complexion of the game. And obviously they went on to a win. So. And, and Georgia Tech did the same thing in that game. They came out in the second half in man-to-man -man defense. Jogo and Mooney beginning the second half for Notre Dame. Here's Mooney. That one rims out. Original starting five on the floor for Georgia Tech. Alvarado, Okogie, Alston, Lammers, and Gay. Now, Mooney has three-point range. He's falling back a little on that shot. That's why he was short. Luger tried to take it away from Lammers. Come a lock. I think they got a, either a walk or a three second pretty, on Lammers. Pr pr three seconds, I think. Pretty good defense. Pretty good defense by Notre Dame. Digging down on the post and making Lammers work in a crowd. Yeah, three second violation. Georgia Tech switches the ball screen action. Boy, really good defense by Gaines. He long the what? 7 3 wingspan. Jogo shoots over him. Not a, not a good shot. A lot of dribbling right there by, by Jogo. And if, if you're going to drive the ball, you better drive the ball right to the rim. Irish just 9 of 34 from the field, 0 for 9 from distance. Here's a Kogi, down low to Gay. Too much dribbling, Notre Dame takes it away. 
Yeah, Gay, Gay has to understand what his strength is, and that's the energy plays, the rebounding, the defense like we saw. Don't try to create off the bounce for yourself. Jogo now 0 for 4 from the field. Here's a Kogi. Splits the defense. Gibbon takes away the rebound. Eight pulls now for Martinez Gibbon. Mooney down low. Alvarado saves it. A Kogi over to Alston. And he'll finish for the easy two, lead back up to 10 for Georgia Tech. You, you know what, Anish, I'm upset with Fluger on the defensive play. It's a two-on-one. Get back, make one of those guys commit. He committed way too early, almost near the foul line on the play defensively. Here's Fluger. Gavin from the elbow. Four assists for Rex Fluger. Gavin, eight points to go along with his eight rebounds. And what started that prior possession run out for Georgia Tech, T.J. Gibbs made the pass inside to the big guy when he wasn't ready to catch the basketball. More T.J. Gibbs' fault than anybody's. Alston for three. Good. Boy, that's a guy that comes in shooting 36% from behind the three-point line and a good sign for Josh Pastner because Georgia Tech... They're not averaging five made threes a game. Big shot right there for the Yellow Jackets. The lead is 11. Jogo over to Mooney. Georgia Tech recovered. Gevin on the inside, and Martinez Gevin has given this team a little bit of a boost offensively. He's the high man for Notre Dame with 10 points. But the Irish staring down a nine-point deficit on the road. Hey. Hey. Passengers will be tuning in to the NBA on a Friday doubleheader. Warriors in Milwaukee to take on the Greek Freak and the Bucks. Then it's Chris Paul and the Rockets against the Suns. Paul and Houston chasing Golden State for the top spot in the West. And Steph Curry, right ankle sprain this morning, so he is out tonight. Hey, and he's put that put that young guy from Oklahoma in Trey there for Young. him. Baby, wow. baby Steph. You see the similarities. He's got every shot in the book. <laughs> he really does. He shoots it deep. He can pass it, leading the country in scoring and assists. There you go. When Notre Dame presses, they fall back into their zone. But you know what they're trying to do now? Trying to create a little offense for themselves off of their, Z, off of their defense. Great call by Mike Bray coming out of the timeout. Here's DJ Harvey. Torres sets the screen for Gibbs. Gets it back. Torres. Gibbs playing wingman. Irish now 0 for 11 from deep. Good decision right there by, by Gibbs to pull that thing back out. Harvey, Jogo over Lammers, and finally it goes for Jogo. Well, it's a second chance opportunity for Notre Dame. That's how they've been in and winning a lot of these latter few games without Bonzi in there. Saved them a possession and got him a three. And now a two-possession game with less than 15 minutes to go here in this second half. Plenty of time. Georgia Tech led by 10 at the break. Gay could not handle the pass, beats the shot clock, oh. and buries the jumper. Abdullah Gay with eight. You know why? When that shot clock winds down, those six, nine guys, they can make them shots. You know why? No pressure right there with the short clock. Hey, I got to shoot it anyways. Torres. Really sagging off of him. Drives baseline. Burns unable to handle it cleanly. Shot clock winding down. Gibbs throws it up. Offensive foul and an offensive way. foul called on Gibbs trying to draw the contact on that three-point shot. This isn't exactly his shot, but Abdullahi Gay hits to beat the shot clock. Tech up by eight.
Georgia Tech head football coach Paul Johnson, flanked by Nate Woody, his new defensive coordinator, coming over from Appalachian State. Yellow Jackets had a bit of a down season this year, and Woody taking over for Ted Roof. I know one thing, if Woody's watching Josh Passner's team right now, it's pretty impressive defense, to say the least. And he's, when, when you have an experienced team, you trust them to make decisions. Like when Farrell's out there and Bonzi Colson, Mike Bray could just let those guys play and make decis decisions. I think he has to do a little more manufacturing of offense for Notre Dame right now. 15 foot or two strong by Lammers. You, you look at what Josh Pastner has had to deal with this season. He said he wishes he could petition the NCAA to not count the early season not conference <laughs> games, which now included some pretty bad losses, Grambling State, Wofford, Wright State. But Akogi was suspended and then injured, and Lammers was not healthy. Todrick Jackson was out this Jackson game. was out, and it was a, a young nucleus, guys who hadn't played together. They couldn't have adequate practices. And as a former head coach, you know, when you can't practice properly, you don't have enough bodies for practice. What's the impact of that when it comes to games? It affects you everywhere. It affects your timing. It affects your chemistry. And like I said, there's a big difference between excuses for losing and reasons. And Georgia Tech, with all the, the losses they had and the injuries they had, that's why you're seeing losses to Grambling and Wofford. No disrespect to any of those teams. Wofford beat North Carolina, Wright State. But Georgia Tech had reasons for losing some of those games it's because of the injuries the setbacks the lack of practice time that they had Notre Dame just has to keep hanging in there to possession game right now where like the latter few games they they've been able to pull them out Syracuse at the end Jackson blocked by Gibbon now Mike Gray who plays the drums here and there. <laughs> you know, so often when we watch Notre Dame's offenses in the past, there was a fluidity to it. Yes. Almost like a symphony. You could set it to Mozart or Beethoven. It almost has to become a metal band now, it, right? It, 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 it's got to be grunge. It, chess match. We're going to pass it here, screen there. Whereas you're right, Anish. It was just, it was just such a beautiful flow offensively. Shot clock violation. Sticks Bray, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Not his first time. No. He has been musically inclined since he was a young boy. Started playing the drums at age seven and clearly still has it. It's Kevin. Uh, continues to be a bright spot for the Irish. He's got 12 points to go along with nine rebounds. I, I, I think the Georgia Tech band wasn't completely impressed with him. There were no symbols up there for Mike to, uh, to, to smash. Play. Lammers sets the screen for Alvarado. Georgia Tech cannot just go around the zone. And Alvarado traveled. You, you, you have to make sure when you see zone, you say, hey, listen, Notre Dame is not in charge of our shot selection. We need to go baseline short corner. We need to screen the zone. We need to attack gaps like Alvarado tried to do right there. As we know, Georgia Tech making fewer than five May threes a game. So let's try to go inside out against the Notre Dame 2-3. Luger over to Gibbs. The three is there. There you go. T.J. Gibbs with 9-7 here in the second half. Well, we talked about him and Fluger stepping up, and they have in the second half. 7-0 Notre Dame run. They've closed to within one. Iris trailed by 10 at the half. Jackson. Driving on Gibbon. Gives it up. Akogi, he's been quiet in the second half. How about Notre Dame could take the lead down nine just a few minutes ago? No Colson, no Farrell. Fluger without a basket or a point. Gibbon has matched a career high with 14, and Notre Dame with its first lead since early in this one. Well, I love TJ Gibbs' decision making. He was scoring the ball earlier. Part of you just can't play this game with your body. You have to play it with your mind, and he has done that in the second half. Lammers on the follow, and Tech retakes the lead. Irish 
briefly had that lead for the first time since 1817. Back to the 1 1 3 zone by Georgia Tech. And what they do a great job of, Anish, is the off guard covers the nail, the area where you'd be if you were shooting a free throw. Kevin inside the free throw line. Mooney, offensive rebound, and able to draw the foul. Notre Dame has seized the momentum. Down 10 at the break, now within one. Notre Dame down 10 at halftime. Do you know how they turned this into a one-point game? Well, T.J. Gibbs has had his hands all over the run in the second half. The bounce pass, the three on the pass from Fluger, and again, another nice dish inside. You know what, Anish? Gavin has played really well in the second half, eight second half points. And when you're not as athletic or as vertical, you have to be more physical. And Gavin has been that in the second half for the Fighting Irish. As we see Mooney at the free throw line right now. John Mooney and Martinez Gebbin with 8 and 14 respectively. And if Mooney makes this, he does not. He's one away from a career high. Gebbin has matched his career high. So you're wondering, no Colson, no Farrell. Fluger has been a no-show. Gibbs 3 of 8, just 9 so far. How is Notre Dame in this game? It's been Mooney. Matching his career high with nine points. Gebbin, 14 points to match a career high. That's why. And in each, they've come out in the second half and held Georgia Tech to four for 12 from the field. So, And it's been predominantly the 2-3 zone. Playing percentages. Georgia Tech not a great three-point shooting team. Let's try to make them beat us, uh, beat us from over the top. They will stay with Tech. A lot of times, too, we've seen Georgia Tech get the ball deep, and then the possession seems to stall. I, I would like to see Lammers catching the ball in that short corner and, and letting him play a little more power basketball. A Kogi rattles home the three. He's got 11. Georgia Tech by three. You're a really versatile player, as we know. He has length. He has a athleticism, a Kogi. And now 43% from behind the three-point line coming in. Jogo beating the defense down the court. Anish, when that ball goes into the high post and it lifts Lammers up to play him, those forwards of the zone need to drop to cover the blocks. Six now for Tyrick Jackson, who also has six rebounds. Jackson had a game winner at the horn earlier this year in a win against the Northwestern. Torres over Lammers. Yeah, I don't like that floater. One, two step power up and shoot the basketball. Haywood over to Lammers. Alvarado. Jackson down the lane to the right hand. His offhand. And, and you know what, Anish? I, I think you have to have that Euro step in your game. The Euro step from Jackson helped him evo avoid the charge. Really nice play from Todrick Jackson. Luger. Gibbs got the screen. Jogo catch and shoot. Lammers another rebound, his seventh. Alvarado all the way to the basket. Basket is good, and the foul. Boy, when they recruited him out of Christ the King High School, one of the reasons they went after this guy is he is fearless. He'll go into any ACC gym. He's home tonight, but he'll attack. He'll be aggressive. We're talking about another New York City guard at Georgia Tech. Now, he's not Marbury or, or, or Kenny Anderson, but he's a four-year guy that was a New York City Catholic League Player of the Year as a junior. And when Josh Pastner went in there, he goes, hey, listen, we could build around this guy. And his high school, Price the King High School in New York, it's produced Lamar Odom, Khalid Reeves, Speedy Claxton, and on the women's side, Tina Charles, Sue Bird, and <laughs> Shamika Holdsclaw. That's a pretty good basketball right there. Devin's pass tipped. Here's Alvarado again. Has it taken away by Gibbs. And Gibbs with the layup to cut the lead to six. T.J. Gibbs from a basketball family. His brother Ashton played at Pitt. Sterling was well-traveled. 
Played at Texas, Seton Hall, and UConn. And when TJ was younger, they had a rule at home. No one-on-ones amongst the brothers because it got too competitive, <laughs> sometimes borderline violent. They could play one-on-one -on -one with other neighborhood kids, just not amongst themselves. Luger, his pass is tipped. Burns in the paint. Lambers denied the entrance. Tipped to Haywood. Here comes Alvarado. Jackson sets, fires, and hits. And he's when those point guards like Alvarado get into the lane, it's almost like a quarterback in football when he's in the pocket. He's surrounded by bigger guys, and he's got to make a great decision and a great pass. Alvarado did. Harvey answers at the other end. He had been one for his last 18, dating back to the Syracuse game. High hopes from him out of DeMatha. The only other freshman out of DeMatha to start it for Notre Dame, Adrian Daly. Alvarado's three, airmailed. Harvey, a top 50 recruit, as we get a whistle. I'll tell you what, Alvarado is going to be a really good player for Josh Passner at Georgia Tech. Good in transition when it's up tempo. Watch him get in the lane, sit down. That's a great decision right there. Georgia Tech with the lead. We got a good one, baby. Call your friends up. Four teams, two conferences. One blockbuster night. High level college basketball here. Oh! What a fun night this is going to be. Monday on ESPN. Uh, should be a big Monday. Duke coming to Miami, Kansas, and West Virginia. Look at the ACC standings. Virginia 4-0. <laughs> beat Syracuse last night. Brad Brownell's got Clemson trending in the right direction. And I don't think you can say enough about what Mike Bray has done. He's played now four halves in a row without Colson and Farrell. And this is the third entire full game without Bonzi Colson. I mean, she's, he's, he's doing it with smoke and mirrors right now. Still not out of this one. Just down six. Jogo to Gibbs. Use the shot fake. Three is not there. Notre Dame, three of 16 from three. Mooney got the rebound. Possession arrow, Georgia Tech on the jump ball. When we looked at those ACC standings, Clemson's good because of their guard play right now. Read the transfer from Robert Moore, Shelton Mitchell, Gabe DeVoe. That's the difference for Clemson and Bron Bron, uh, Brad Brownell's team this year than in all of the years past. And I, we were talking, I said, I saw Tony Bennett's team practice in the fall. And after practice, I go, Tony, man, hang in there, a little bit of a rebuild. I am shocked what Virginia's doing because I'll tell you, Tony, I had him against West Virginia. Tony Bennett is doing a marvelous job with that team. You talk about simplicity and execution. They run pack line defense. They double the post, big, big. They run blocker mover on offense. That is a terrific, well-coached team because I'm not sure how talented Virginia is. How about Josh Okoge? Skying for the putback. He's got 13. Eight-point lead for Georgia Tech. Yellow Jackets led by 10 at halftime. Notre Dame took the lead at one point by one here in the second half. Gabbitt, 15 footer, banked home. <laughs> Deposit slip for the young man. And a career high 16 now for Martinez Gabbitt. You know what, Anish? I didn't think he wanted to shoot that. I felt he thought he was going to throw the bounce pass, the high low pass at a cutter on the baseline. And then uh, it, was, it was online. It was long, but it was online. Extra pass to Kogi. And we'll get a foul. And it's going to be on Harvey. I tell you, as a coach, you love when guys play to their strength and this is a terrific athlete he finds his way to the basket and and makes an athletic play right there not bad for a guy who was a zero star recruit zero and give him credit he originally committed to brian gregory who then got let go and josh got the job but uh 
The young guy out of Snellville, Georgia, Shiloh High School, stayed committed to the Yellow Jackets, and it uh, proved incredibly beneficial to Josh Pass. I asked him, I said, what convinced you to stick with your commitment to Georgia Tech? And he said, I asked Josh Pastner, will you play fast? Pastner said yes, and he says, okay, I'm in. Well, you know what? If he'd asked any of us that, they would have said, yeah, we're going to play fast. Now, to 327 in pace of play right now, but I know this. He made a great decision going there. He's playing for a great coach. He's at a great academic institution. Absolutely, we're going to play fast. Harvey just picked up his third. Four and a half to go in regulation. Georgia Tech has led for most of the game. Austin Torres back in. Fifth year senior whose mom played soccer at Notre Dame. Gebbin to the bench. 16 points, nine rebounds for the Lithuanian. Anish, Notre Dame has to make sure now that they get a, a body on a Kogi when the ball's shot because he is really starting to assert himself inside on the offensive glass. He, he's the one guy, he's the one guy that has the athleticism that could take things over for Georgia Tech. And they're just looking at the shot clock right now. Second meeting of the season between Notre Dame and Georgia Tech. The Irish won back on December 30th. That's when Notre Dame still had a healthy Bonzi Colson and a healthy Matt Farrell. No, I think the shot clock was uh, uh, a late, it was on 18, went to 30, and then it never ran. Mike Bray told us yesterday that Matt Farrell, who sprained his ankle in the first half of the NC State game a week ago and did not make the trip to Syracuse, Farrell did not make the trip to Atlanta either. Farrell thinks he might be ready to play Saturday against North Carolina. Mike Bray told us realistically the best bet is that Farrell returns next Tuesday against Louisville. It's a long season. This is an NCAA tournament team, Notre Dame. No, no sense rushing him back. You've done a great job without him and Bonzi for right now. And Mike knows that. Mike knows, hey, hey, having both of them out is really debilitating for us. But if we can get Farrell back, make sure he comes back 100%. Now they rule that the foul occurred in the backcourt, so the shot clock back to 30. Haywood straight away three. And a foul called on Lammers in the battle for the rebound. Good shot for Georgia Tech with a lead like that with four to play. Three on Lammers. When you see that zone, number one, you want to try to beat it down the floor with the break. Then when we're five on five, let's go short corner, high post. Let's attack gaps, which means try to split guys with the dribble. Screen the zone, and then finally, offensive rebound. Kevin in the high post. Fluger still without a point. Harvey, corner three, lets it fly, <laughs> and Notre Dame cuts the lead to three. Here's the thing you're fearful of when you're playing Notre Dame. They know how to win close games. You look at the Syracuse game over the weekend, you say how. Lammers with a nice spin move. And the cushion back to five for Georgia Tech. We well, got a timeout on the floor. Lammers with a big basket. We come down the home stretch when we come back. ESPN exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Easter. Auto and home insurance for the modern world. And Caramel m and We're making caramel fun. Following our game, it is Texas and TCU. We get to see Mohamed Bamba almost six blocks per game over his last four. That's what happens when you have a seven foot nine wingspan. <laughs> 
one of the great young freshmen in the country, of which there are uh, many this year. And again, the Big 12, a terrific conference, top to bottom. I'll tell you, West Virginia really showed me a lot. I think emotions drain energy, whether it's positive emotions or negative emotions. Them beating Oklahoma and then bouncing back and getting Baylor with a quick turnaround. I, I just think that speaks volumes for Bob Huggins' team. If they beat Kansas on Monday, you'll start to hear the chatter. Maybe this is the year that Kansas' streak finally <laughs> comes, ends. Comes to an end. What a great play right there. Wonderful back screen. They roll him into the post. Mooney off the back screen in a terrific find from T.J. Gibbs. A career high 11 for Mooney. Gavin has a career high 16, both on the floor for Notre Dame. And Anish, that's about the third time tonight that Notre Dame's come out of a timeout and Mike Bray has gotten them a basket. Jackson on the bigger Mooney using the window and Mooney pulls down the rebound. Irish can tie it with a three. Switching the ball screen act. You ask yourself as a coach, which beats you, the open shot or the mismatch? It's the open shot, so Passner switching those screens. Short clock at five. Gibbs down the lane, runner won't go. Notre Dame staying with the zone. You should be talking, you should be pointing, who, declaring who has the basketball. And when you're in the zone and you got the ball, you got it man to man. Okogi, he's got 15. Tech up by five. Boy, what a great guy to have in a high post there because he could score it and he could drive it like we just saw from the free throw line. Gavin against Lammers. The hook shot won't go. Lammers with the rebound. Well, you're seeing Lammers length affect the shot for certain on that play. Didn't block it, but he affected it. He's one of the best shot blockers in the ACC and in the country. Averaging three blocks per game, almost three and a half a season ago. Akogi from 15. Mooney the rebound. Notre Dame with one timeout, Anish. Georgia Tech sitting on two. Gives to the basket. Lammers again there to alter the shot. A absolutely. And twice now, TJ Gibbs has gone down that lane and tried finishing with his right hand and left it short. Final minutes of regulation. Lammers with a double double now. 10 points, 10 rebounds. His sixth of the season. Shot clock at five. Akogi falling away in and out Gibbs Fluger 0 for 7 from the field 0 for 8 Jackson tried to exaggerate on the contact and that is just the 15 foul on Notre Dame so they, they, they have fouls to give, and they have to give them now because they want to put Georgia Tech on the free throw line. So this allows Georgia Tech to maybe run a little more clock. And, and East, right now, Notre Dame has to face guard. We're going to try to deny the ball from coming in bounds. Hopefully we get a steal or a five count. But as soon as it comes in, we have to foul because we have one more to give before Georgia Tech gets into the one-on-one. -on -one. Alvarado, one of their best free throw shooters, fouled immediately. Just the sixth team foul, so still a non-shooting foul. On the next one, Georgia Tech to the line for a one and one. Now coming in, we have Jackson. It's just 63% from behind the free throw line. Boy, they boy. went for the steal. Yeah, it looked like they almost had it almost right there. Almost had it. Instead, it's knocked out now of bounds. We, we can, you can go to the monitor now if there's any any question as to who that went off of. Into the hands of Okogi. Luger wraps him up, and Okogi to the line for a one-and-one. And Okogi, one. two for three 
on the night thus far in 78 from behind the three-point line. Free throw line. Free throw line. Georgia Tech began the season six and seven. Josh Pastner was trying to convince folks that that was a different team. They beat Miami last Wednesday, followed it up with a win against Yale over the weekend, a non-conference game. And I get it, Notre Dame's shorthanded, but if you're Georgia Tech, it's an opportunity to seize against an opponent that isn't playing with its best players with Colson and Farrell out. And if Georgia Tech hangs on, they're going to 2-1 and one in league play and with a game against Pitt coming up, which is very winnable. And the niche, Notre Dame hasn't scored over the final three minutes. Mooney from the outside. The rebound by Jackson. Notre Dame in pursuit. They will not foul. And Georgia Tech hangs on for a seven-point win. And a wonderful defensive performance from the Yellow Jackets. And that's what Josh Pastner wants his team's identity to be. It was tonight, that's for certain. Notre Dame falls for the first time in ACC play. Georgia Tech has now won three straight. They play Pittsburgh this weekend. And Josh Pastner's team has a chance to get on maybe a little bit of a roll here. We'll talk to the Georgia Tech head coach after this. Yellow Jackets winners at home against the Fighting Irish. Final score 60 to 53. Coming up next here on ESPNU, Jalen Fisher and TCU will take on Texas Big 12. Boy, that has been an Iroquois gauntlet this season for everybody. Loser of this TCU-Texas game falls to one and three in league play. Georgia Tech now two and one in conference and a much different team here after Christmas. We're joined by head coach Josh Pastner. Josh, Notre Dame made a run. They took the lead in the second half. What was the difference down the stretch for you guys? Well, Notre Dame's a really good team. I mean, they're very obviously very well coached by one of the best coaches in the country. So they were going to make a run, and, they, and they're, they've got good players. The thing with us is we were able to defend. We got in a rut where we couldn't score in about a three, four-minute segment. We just couldn't score, but we really guarded. Uh, it allowed us to, to, to get some transition points, and, uh, you know, that's a great win. Listen, this, this league is just a bear, and uh, every game is just such a possession-by-possession possession game, but our guys found a way. Guys, we've been getting better post-Christmas, and, um, and it's been nice to see it validated with some wins, and we still have a long, long way to go, but, but we are improving and getting better. Josh, you, you guys are improving because you're healthy. You finally have a full allotment, but, uh, you know, we talked earlier today, what were a couple of your keys coming in tonight against Notre Dame that you were able to uh, implement? Well, one is, you know, defensive rebounding. I mean, they've been, I think, the best in the league at offensive rebounding. We really did a nice job of, of rebounding tonight on the defensive end. And then secondly, we guarded the three. Now, they hit some threes in the second half, but they were 0 for 9 the first half. Uh, for the most part, we guarded the three well, uh, and that's a that's a key part against Notre Dame. But we really rebounded well, and what they've been doing in their wins, that they've just kicked teams rear end uh, on the glass. And tonight, we did a nice job on the defensive glass. Josh, how important was uh, a Kobe for you guys tonight? Well, without him, we lose the game. Pretty simple. Um, he's just a, he's a difference maker for us. His motor, he plays so hard. Um, you know, he's a key, key cog for what we're trying to do, and he's a ph phenomenal young man at the same time. And the follow-up coach, Ben Lammers, another double-double, 10 points, 10 rebounds. What does a healthy Ben Lammers mean to this basketball team? Well, you know, everything keys around Ben Lammers for us, and um, he's starting to get healthy, and he's able to practice. So, you know, post-Christmas, you can see him getting back to the old Ben, and um, and that's what we need. And he's a, he's a true mechanical engineer. I mean, the kid's not only a great basketball player, but let's not forget, he's a true mechanical engineer. That's hard to do and be a great <laughs> player in the ACC. It's a great credit to Ben Lammers. Yeah, I don't know how many players in the league can play basketball at an all-conference level and then go and build and program robots. Josh, thank you. Best of luck. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it so much. So this Georgia Tech team, I think, as Josh Pastner said, you have to look at it BC before Christmas. I like and it. And then PC. <laughs>
post Christmas and now that they're healthy, now that Akogi is back from his suspension, now that the finger is healed, now that they can practice and mass, this is a dangerous team in the ACC. Good enough to get to the NCAA tournament? I don't know. There's some scars from non-conference, but can they create chaos in this league? Absolutely. There's no question they can. And then all of a sudden now we got a young Pittsburgh team coming up for Georgia Tech on Saturday on the road. But after that, boy, Virginia, as we know, the number three team in the country, North Carolina, Florida State, and each in this league, and you hear me say it all the time, it's the best league in America. Uh, and I don't care what measuring stick you use, historic, contemporary, what they're doing this year. No easy outs. But this is a different Georgia Tech team than we saw, like you said, B.C. before Christmas. B.C. and P.C. Josh Pastner's <laughs> Yellow Jackets come away with their second conference win of the season, knocking off Notre Dame. The Irish now 3-1. and one. And for Mike Bray, the challenge is going to be to try to figure this out, not just without Bonzi Colson, but at least for this weekend, probably without Matt Farrell as well, his point guard. Notre Dame plays North Carolina on Saturday, then home against Louisville on Tuesday. At the top of the hour on ESPNU, it is TCU and Texas. We send you to Big 12 country at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Final score from Atlanta, Georgia Tech by seven.